Tiangong is actually the third Tiangong. Uh, before that, there was Tiangong 1 and then Tiangong 2, and they were precursors to this main station. This is basically China's step uh, to space and beyond, so they've made no bones about it. They want to go to the moon uh, by 2030, and this is basically their sort of needed first step. Well, they're calling, calling it the third step, but it is sort of the most important one at the moment, and it's this really cool uh, space station. It's in low Earth orbit, so that's about 400 to 450 kilometres above our heads and it's shaped in this T sort of shape and it's got three main modules and the last one actually only went up uh, towards the end of last year. So uh, yeah, these uh, astronauts are going up there and they're basically exchanging uh, people that are going to be there, I think they would have been there for six months, the current crew up there, uh, and they're basically changing them over, which is really, really cool. Um, there's lots of science experiments up there. Uh, and then and basically they have these arms as well on the on the space station. It's absolutely mind blowing, but basically it is just the next step to getting to the moon. How sophisticated is it compared to the International Space Station? Well, what I really think is cool about this is that it's actually much smaller. So there's only three modules and the ISS has about 16 and it's about 20% of the mass of, of the ISS. So it's much, much, much smaller. But the thing is as well, the ISS is actually quite old and it's actually going to be decommissioned by about 2030. So there's every possibility that Tiangong will be the only uh, constantly habited uh, space craft above our heads after 2030. So they are doing some experiments up there, but like I said, a lot of things are actually just testing to see how everything works. Mm. Interestingly enough, for the very first time, a civilian has gone to the station. Yeah, this gives me hope. Well, I've always openly <laughs> said <laughs> that I do not want to go anywhere with anything incendiary strapped to my backside, but, but uh, this gives some of us hope out there. Uh, look, this, this guy is a, basically a university professor and he's actually an expert in payloads. So that's the stuff that gets delivered by rockets. In this particular case, he's an expert in dealing with all those science experiments I uh, and in their equipment that I mentioned earlier. And these things are getting really sophisticated. So they actually need to start sending people that know how to take care of them, um, how to use them, how to put them together and how to basically make sure that the experiments run. So what's really interesting about um, Guy Hao Chao is that he uh, was actually actually motivated apparently uh, when he saw on the news in 2003 about the first Chinese manned space flight and he was 17 at the time. He's now 36 and five years ago he advertised, uh, they, he saw an ad for uh, some specialists like payload specialists and engineers and he applied and he basically worked his butt off on a very large number <laughs> of uh, physical exercises and all sorts of things um, and got in, yeah, basically. So he's gone up what a, great, what a great story. You talked about China's ambitions. They want to get to the moon. How ambitious, well, how close are they to fulfilling those ambitions? Well, Bev, the thing is that China has not been part of this space race like you know, NASA and the former USSR. They have not for as long as we have, I suppose, the Western countries. Uh, it's no small feat to get to the moon. But, you know, interestingly, 50 years ago, plus or minus a couple of weeks from now, the first US space station, I don't remember Skylab, I think there might be a few people in West Australia that might remember Skylab, uh, that was launched. Now, the CSNA, which is the, the Chinese sort of um, space national agency, was formed in 1993, right? So that's that's not that long ago. They achieved their first human space flight in 2003, and now China is in the top two for launches to orbit. So it's an incredible um, feat over the last 30 years. They've landed a rover, U2, on the far side of the moon, which they've, nobody's done. They uh, brought back the youngest and the most recent lunar samples, the last lunar samples that uh, Western um, NASA brought back, basically, uh, with the Apollo missions, was 1976. Um, they've got their own Mars rover going around. So, honestly, I would my assessment is that this is, this is looking pretty good. Yeah, they could move very rapidly. Do you think they'll look to collaborate with other countries or do you think they just want to be sort of going forward on their own? Look, they've actually been quite explicit about wanting uh, to take foreign astronauts up to their, their space station in Tiangong, as well as potentially tourists. 
uh, they want to they, they hope for international collaboration including with the US when there's a bit of a problem with that but they have already collaborated with say the Italians for example um, and they've also got lots and lots of science collaborations with with other countries so Poland and um, Belgium Germany so it's not actually that unusual to collaborate with China it's just the problem with the US is that uh, rightly or wrongly a law was passed in 2011 that basically says NASA cannot use government funds to collaborate with the Chinese space interests. So that does actually put a little bit of a, a cork in that at the moment, rightly or wrongly, mm. and that does limit um, that collaboration with the US and China, but certainly doesn't really affect uh, some of the other countries that are already collaborating. Yeah, interesting. All right, thanks for bringing it to life for us as always, Claire. Thank you. Talk soon. Always welcome. Thanks, Bev.